Okay, so Tom, I wanted to bring you on the show because you've I've seen you on LinkedIn. I saw you recently were named top 100 most influential PPC experts globally, managed over $250 million in Google ads, and just an all-around expert with PPC. So I wanted to dive in and talk about uh, your predictions for 2024. Where is it going? We had a crazy year and just we're let's let's dive in and see where it's going and help people kind of navigate that and keep their ads profitable with all the craziness going on. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for having me on. So with predictions for 2024, I think firstly, we're going to see a lot more pro max smart machine learning names when it comes to campaign types and we just had demand gen, you know, be an upgraded discovery come out, which is yeah. very interesting. And I see with the whole Google product roadmap, I see it really going in the direction of aligning a lot more with Meta, actually, in terms of the products. And I was really surprised seeing that with demand gen, with them having the carousel ads, the video ads, and also the lookalike audiences kind of pulling, you know, uh, features straight out of Meta almost. You know, yeah. a lot of the Meta guys I worked with were were saying to me, like, wow, this is a really cool product. This is a bit of a... Um, a bit of a wild card really um and i think you see that in other products google's been working on this year with performance max and all the automation i feel like they're really pushing towards um i don't know if it's taking advertisers from meta trying to take that spend over and you know maybe google be the main channel for advertisers i don't know if it's that or if it's just them trying to kind of level the playing field in terms of product features yeah, I, I think it's a lot of experts are, are starting to say the same thing. You're not siloed as much. And I think agencies, freelancers, in-house, whoever it is running ads, I think it's getting to where you need to be on more than one platform uh, is what it's coming down to. And the platforms are mimicking each other. They're they're using automation that that's not terrible anymore because the automation, they've been around for 10 years, just nobody used it. It was junk. Now... Uh, you, you've got Performance Max was Google first, and then Meta started doing, or, or Facebook ads for new people, same thing. Um, they started doing their Advantage Plus audience. They did Advantage Plus ads and Advantage Plus placements, which is their automation thing uh, for, for people that, that don't know. They started uh, Performance Max audiences, which is kind of like Performance Max. Give it some signals, and it'll just find people you don't really put in detail targeting yeah this is the conversation i had with a meta guy i worked closely with the other day where i was saying oh i'm pretty much running everything on broad now you know especially on bigger accounts yeah. utilizing broad and it's funny because he's like oh it's the same or meta i'm just running everything on broad now because i asked him because i don't i'm not day-to-day -day with meta either so i asked him like oh do you still use audience targeting like what's what's the crack at the moment and he said, no, it's mostly broad for a lot of the big brands. Yeah, and, and we started testing that Advantage Plus audience, which is kind of the same reaction as Performance Max. This is stupid. Where's all my where's all my buttons? They took them away. It's like, no, no, we'll just find people magically with AI and, and big data and other buzzwords. And it's like, I don't trust you. Um, but we, <laughs> we tested it. Uh, I, I think it's the same thing. You need an existing account. Because we, we tested ones that have been running uh, over two years, and they had data, they had conversions, and then we dropped in an Advantage Plus, which is pretty much nothing. It's just show it on Facebook and find people that will buy it, and it's doing surprisingly well. And I think Performance Max kind of did the same thing. Don't do it on a brand new account, but it can work if it can figure it out. Yeah, 100%. I think it's really business dependent as well yes um i think following on from your episode with boris actually around the um ppc uh, google ads reps um, <laughs> yeah and uh i had a lot of thinking around that actually and i think it's really important to ask when you're speaking to your google rep ask them about these products you know ask them where is it heading how are you using it because they can share a lot of other insights from other accounts they're working on if you're fortunate enough to have a, you know, um, an actual Google rep that actually works at Google, 
in you know Dublin or London, for example, yeah. um, which I've been fortunate to have and speak to a lot, you can um, you can see their kind of changing like insights over time on a product. So a lot of PPC guys will say, "Oh, performance max is rubbish. It's this. It's that." But actually, you know, a year later, or even six months later, it can, it can be a very different product. Yeah. You know, them they're always having internal meetings, and ultimately, like a lot of people like to crap all over Google reps and, you know, ignore what they say and all these kind of things. There's a lot of bad press out there about them. But at the end of the day, they work at Google and you don't. Yeah. So they're going to be privy to those internal meetings, those product changes, those new, they're going to know what's on the horizon. They're going to know what's being sunsetted. And although they can't exactly tell you, you can always get clues, I think, by how they talk about things. So I think people often like disregard, a lot of PPC experts disregard what you can get from your Google rep when, a lot of the time, I'll just jump on a call and ask them open-ended questions. I'll just ask them about, you know, what are you seeing with demand gen at the moment, for example? Um, you know, how are you seeing it being used? What's the best practice? And sometimes they'll just send you, you know, the best practice document, which might not help all that much. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes they might say, ah, I've actually just had a call with this other client and they're using it this way. And you're like, huh, okay, that's interesting. That's something that you can't find, you know, in the in the open web. Yeah, and and the the bad press with Google reps, there there for for people that don't know, because most experts can sort it out that they outsource. It's Teleperformance, and then some other company that with like an eight point font at the bottom of their signature. It's in their signature, so it, if it doesn't say outsourced or provided by or blah blah blah, it's actually because they're all at Google.com. But there's people that are at the actual Google. Uh, and then there's the third party call center and, and, and you could hear it. There's 500 other people talking and they have a script that, that it's very poor training. It's not the people. I'm sure they're nice people. They have horrible training and Google pushes them and gives them bonuses for people to spend more, which is garbage. That's what everybody's complaining about. But the people that work at Google, yeah, you can get into new betas uh, that you have to ask for. Uh, you can ask them open-ended questions. It's just kind of filter the Google reps. Some of them are useful, get good information. Some, uh, most of them, uh, just trying to get their bonus to get you to spend more. So you, you have to go through that. But I mean, go, going back to all the new features, I mean, yeah, what, what else do you think it's, it's switching to? Because you, you mentioned demand gen and uh, other stupid names uh performance max <laughs> de demand generation pretty much instead of discovery which is just kind of branding it's like no it, it demand generation <laughs> anyway i mean what, what where else do you think it's it's going with this i think it's going more off platform you know you see this a lot talked about on linkedin with conversion tracking landing pages all those kind of off platform optimizations and I've often said that it's 50-50 and then in one or two years, it might be like 80-20 with 80% is the off-platform off optimizations and 20% is actually in-platform. So I think as they take away the control in the platforms, um, things off-platform will become much more important. And that's what I talk a lot about to a lot of other PPC freelancers. Um, some, when I coach them and I have coaching sessions, I'll often get asked, like, how do I become a better PPC freelancer? And my number one response is become a product guy, become obsessed with the product. Yeah. So most PPC experts I find don't know the product they're selling well enough. And that's what will set you apart more than anything. Because as the technical playing field becomes more level with all these new products, new campaign types from Google ads, all the automation, less control, you know, creative will still be massively important and we can talk about that, but it will become a level playing field technically. So I feel like a lot of agencies out there are very, very good technically, but then where you can set yourself apart, particularly as a freelancer, I speak from my own experience is you have worked with the biggest brands in that industry or in that niche. You can then bring all that experience from all the little bits and pieces, you know, about those products to the ad copy, to the landing pages, you know, that other people writing the other ads on the SERP, might not know about yeah and and keeping up with how how much it's constantly changing changing and getting all that that training and um 
just kind of digging in, learning all the new things. I think that's critical. And it, it used to be much slower. So people didn't constantly read things and YouTube wasn't as big for learning. It was just stupid videos. Uh, but now there's there's more B2B content. Even TikTok has some something that's not just stupid videos. Uh, LinkedIn more switched to, I mean, it's a feed with business tips. It used to be finding a job. So now there's so many more options and, and we do that. When, I mean, we do a lot of training, and when we uh, interview people, what do you read? Who do you follow? Where, where's your ongoing training? I, I think that it's it's really dead that people. This is you know this is the way I've always done it. It's like that that doesn't work. Something from six months ago could be completely obsolete with how fast it's going. And I I, I know you do the one on one training. There's a lot of good programs. There's a lot of bad ones, but there's a lot of experts that that you can book them for one on one calls. Some of them have courses, some of them have books, uh, there's conferences, virtual conferences, like we've had some on the show too, you know, PPC Live UK, uh, and then Miles has, has his mastery program and some little courses, You versus Google, uh, the book and the training from Solutions 8, I mean, it just, uh, Michelle Morgan was on here with Paid Media Pros, uh, she has one, I mean, everyone's releasing these things. It, it's not so much because of the flood of, of courses trend. I think a lot of it is experts. It's, it's like, what are you currently reading? Who do you follow on LinkedIn? Uh, what blogs do you read? What legit YouTube channel do you watch? And, and that training has become more critical than ever. Mm, yeah, I think a lot of PPC experts get stuck in their ways. I totally agree. Yeah, They get stuck with you know product types, um, campaign types. And in terms of what I always stick to, I kind of have two sources of big information in my life. So it would be one, uh, the Paid Search podcast by um, Chris Schaefer and Jason Rothman. Yeah. Um, that's a US-based one, I think. So I've been listening to them guys for absolute years and years and years, ever since I started. And it's super cool that the podcast has, yeah, lasted, I think, almost a decade now. Um, yeah. And it's a really geeky podcast, which I absolutely love. It's not for everyone, but that's what I really like to hear about. It's the really geeky stuff. They like find the little, you know, button that appeared and then they talk about it. And then they really bring their experience. Like I was saying, you know, bringing your experience when you've been in the game for a while of, oh, this is kind of like what they did five years ago. Oh, this little thing. Where are they going with this? How could we use this? Asking all these questions, not just taking things at face value. And then the other part um, of content that I consume a lot is actually more business stuff, the more marketing as a whole, and as I said, more product uh, focused content. So just learning more about, you know, funnels, landing pages, like how to sell a product, yeah, um, more more stuff like that, because I, I feel that feeds in so much to Google Ads. Yeah, and and that has a lot of great content too. Where I could remember years ago, it was blogs and eBooks, and just the technology has changed. There's a lot of video, uh, a lot of following people on social media is is bigger. LinkedIn mentioned one. You publish a ton of stuff on LinkedIn, and and just on a side note, there there there's no expert that's just I don't read anything. I just manage accounts. I know everything. I mean that's that person's not going to be an expert very long three to six months they're obsolete so i i mean i i've been in it for over a decade but i'll read your stuff i'll read stuff from miles uh, podcasts whatever even a youtube video it's like wow i i didn't know that like i didn't even know that or performance max came out it's like okay who's got everyone was confused at first so you had who's publishing what let's follow it buy something hire someone outside auditors like you you got to learn it fast but um yeah, it's it's just that constant learning is has become more critical than ever, and uh, you know I it used to be conferences, and then that kind of switched the in person stuff. But the the constant learning and learning from experts in the field, I I think that's still there, and that's that's still important to to follow people and keep up with with industry news, especially. I I think that's one thing going into the future. I don't think this pace is going to slow down. Every two months, there's an overhaul. So you have to find someone on LinkedIn, hire somebody, buy someone's course. Uh, I mean, what a, a legit course. There's crap ones out there, but uh, a, a good one. And you, you've got to learn it fast. Yeah, I was just thinking about Performance Max there. So I was really surprised with Performance Max 
um, when it first came out. So I was at an in-house brand that was pretty big at the time. At the moment, at, at the time when Performance Max first launched, and I was in the, I think it, they call it open beta. It's like the very first stage of a beta. Yeah. Um, or maybe closed <laughs> rather than open. Oh, no, that, yeah, um, closed, then open, then, I don't know, released. Right. Yeah, so I think it was the closed. It was the very first. Uh, they said it was, you know, handful in the UK that were in this Performance Max beta. And they really pitched it as, uh, Google really pitched it as a solution for small businesses, particularly service-based businesses that, you know, didn't have an expert, um, you know, maybe didn't have an agency and would just kind of do it themselves like a DIY all-in-one campaign. And I thought, okay, that's fine. I'm probably never going to use it actually. Yeah. Because at the time and still now, you know, managing accounts that are in the hundreds or millions um, of spend per month, I thought, okay, this is probably not something that's going to affect these accounts, right? Yeah. I was, I was really surprised that they switched it because that was never the kind of um, spiel that was coming out of Google when it first launched. It was first in beta. It was all. It was definitely introduced as a all-in-one, you know, uh, service-based, you know, for your kind of local landscaper client that spends one one k a month. Yeah. You know that can that can kind of have coverage across all the channels and you know. Um, you're probably not expecting the best performance out of that, but it was geared towards that rather than replacing smart shopping. <laughs> um, and I was super surprised to see that kind of switch. And I, I always wonder like what happened behind the scenes and I guess we'll never know. Um, but yeah, I was really surprised to see performance max kind of take over and, and sunset smart shopping. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Uh, it was buried in the back that, that uh, we, we don't use the smart the ones beginners, I don't even know how to set those accounts up, but if you set, set up a brand new one, it does that smart thing, uh, that kind of yeah. DIY, the, um, the local one where you can set the conversion goal as, uh, in-store visits with the IP address or, you know, click the, uh, get directions button or, or called from the map thing that, that cheesy smart one, that actually rolled into Performance Max. That one doesn't exist anymore. Uh, if you have a restaurant or something, you have to do a Performance Max, and then you can set the goal as in-store visits, like with the IP address. Uh, and, and Facebook has kind of the same thing. Not, I mean, they changed it a little bit. but um, and, and we did run that for uh, you know restaurants and local businesses. That, that was an interesting one where you you're not going to click and buy something necessarily. I mean, maybe a restaurant, you, you click an order, maybe, um, but a lot of times you'll you'll click, you'll look at the menu, you'll, you'll just drive there. So that can, or just brand it, you know, or download a coupon or get the email, these micro conversions. It can actually work well for local businesses because, yeah, searches, or you could want, do one search and with the performance max or just a performance max, maybe 20 bucks a day, because to a restaurant or, or a local boutique or uh, a, a bar or something or event venue, it doesn't really matter. And a lot of them run it themselves. If you're on YouTube, Gmail, search banner ads and just blast it out. You know, here, here's a, a, a new restaurant. You know, we have this type of food. We got special buy one, get one free Friday nights, whatever, happy hour. That could just be blasted to everyone. It's not much money. It's not much optimizing. It's like, you know, that's that's actually not a bad idea for performance max. And I, I think that's it. Maybe that was the original plan for people that don't have much expertise. Right. Yeah. That's exactly how I heard it and interpreted it from Google when they were, you know, including us in the beta. And I pretty much said, no, we don't want to be in the beta actually. Yeah. Um, Cause I just didn't think it would be, yeah, I thought it was totally for local service based businesses at that, low level of spend and just complete opposite to the brand I was working at, which was a massive e-com business. Um, and then, yeah, a few months later, kind of they, Google kept asking us to, to be in the beta and, you know, um, the kind of documentation that came out on the wider web and all the blogs and everything covering performance max once it became out of beta or, you know, people started talking about online. Um, 
that really switched to oh this is going to replace shopping and it was like a really hard switch it was it was super weird um and i always wonder what happened behind the scenes but um yeah it's it's still something i use mostly in shopping only mode which i wonder how long that will be around yeah uh, where you only use the feed with performance max so you don't add any assets that's also a super like janky weird hacky process i actually had to explain this to someone the other day teach them how to do a feed only performance max and also explain to them what feed only performance max is which is really hard to explain because the way they marketed put together performance max as a product i think is quite confusing yeah i think the name is confusing i think the way they talk about it's confusing i think the way it sits in a google account is confusing um you know i spend a lot of time pondering on you know um hierarchy in an account as well and do a lot of tests around that i think that's super interesting where a lot of ppc experts will say oh i'll do performance max or not Whereas in a lot of accounts, I run like performance max, feed only, and then I run standard shopping, search, DSA, um, and now demand gen, I used to run discovery, and I'll run all the channels separately as well. And then, you know, you've got those charts that show you what enters into a um, search, depending on, it's normally performance max will take priority over most of those. Yeah. But then with some of them, it can be actually the ad rank um, and the campaign can take priority like the singular campaigns for example demand gen can actually be entered instead of performance max so i think all that hierarchy stuff is quite complicated very confusing but also very interesting yeah i i think it definitely helps our job security i don't think it got any easier it's much more complicated even with that that that's a new thing everyone's talking about mostly people outside the industry that oh you know ppcs and seo and web designers they're all going to be out of the job because AI. It's like AI, it, it's the same as an engineer running this massive machine that just, you know, the industrial thing, it, it just creates things, you know, all these different machines and lasers and all this. Like, yes, there's factories that make products over and over and over, and there's a highly qualified, skilled person that runs that machine. You can't just buy it and turn it on. It, and they're not making things by hand, but there are people running that factory. And I, I think that's that's kind of analogy i can think of for for ppc and seo and web design there there's all this ai and all this crazy new technology but it takes an expert to run it that that's the difference it's like yes we have ai and i I, and all this automation running specifically in google ads it's like okay here's performance max it's extremely complicated and then there's demand gen and then there's auto bidding and then you could go into broad match with automation and automate your bid. It's like if it was easy, you would just call Google's eight hundred number. They'd walk you through the setup, and you'd just make a fortune. That that'd be the end of it. But anyone willing to try that, do it, and then you know, give us a call because it's gonna fail, and we'll we'll fix it. <laughs> yeah, I think context is really important in all those <clears throat> scenarios, right? So I heard Ed Leak talk about recently how he uses Quality Score as a diagnostic tool now. And I thought, hmm, that's an interesting change, right? Because quality score used to be one of the first, you know, three to five things you would look at in an account. Yeah. But I actually found myself barely using it at all, right? Um, yeah, same here. More, more so only if something goes wrong. And yeah, Ed Leak hit it, hit the nail on the head with saying it's a diagnostic tool, and that, that's exactly how I describe it now. And I had to, I was doing some training recently. Um, for a couple of guys at an agency and that's exactly how i explained it to them was because they were they were really reading all this stuff online around quality score and ad rank and they kind of put it at the top of their list and i think the context is missing right yeah so when for example social paid social guys learning ppc they kind of assume it's the same in a lot of ways and the content like you spoke about some of the kind of rubbish content out there doesn't help at all because I find a lot of those YouTube videos are paid social, maybe experts, but then they're creating, as you said, they've skimmed YouTube and then they've just created a Google ads ultimate hack video thing. And they're talking about, you know, um, quality score and ad rank and all, you need your quality score to be this high yeah. and all these kind of things that we know in the grand scheme of things, big picture is not anywhere near the top of your list right now. It may, it may have been a few years ago um so that's something i see a lot when i'm doing training is 
just focusing on the wrong things, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think the content on LinkedIn is great for that because you can really get inside like a lot of experts minds, you know, right? Like a lot of the guys, um, particularly a lot of the Dutch guys, it seems like every, <laughs> all, all the PPC experts on LinkedIn are all, uh, all from the Netherlands. I know uh, they're all there. Yeah. That's, that's some PPC hub over there. Yeah. We had a great joke the other day, uh, saying they must learn PPC in kindergarten in uh, the Netherlands. <laughs> I, I guess so. Yeah. All the experts are there. There's just one giant building, all the PPC experts, just, they all work out of there. I don't know. Pretty much. So they are great for reading, you know, how they talk about things, reading what they're talking about, you know, all those kind of things for someone who's running accounts, who's, you know, day to day in the platform. And I try to make my content as kind of close to that as possible actually giving my opinion on things yeah. rather than just saying top tips do this and that because but like ai can say that anyone can say that but if you're giving your context um that's the most important thing is context yeah definitely and and a lot of experts will they'll repost a news story but then kind of give you some insight on it rather than just reposting something from search engine land it's like well anyone could do that or ai can scrape it it's like okay Here's something new that came out. What does an expert say about it? Oh, I mean, that's just like the regular news, but I mean, no one really watches it. It's all just fear. Uh, but it, it's the same thing. You, you get an expert commentary on something that just happened. And I, I think that's good content. And that's something, you know, I actually read because the new things come out. It's like, okay, you know, go through LinkedIn, see what people say uh, and, and get that expert level. But I, I want to jump back to that quality score, you know, and, and Ed Leak's got really good stuff too. He publishes everywhere. Uh, it actually has two different training programs, one just regular Google, one for agencies. Uh, a lot of people have stuff like that. But um, a, a quality score, I, I think, is second or even third tier because you, you, go, you go with your usual, the profit numbers, you know, just conversions, conversion rate, cost, CPA, which is cost per acquisition or cost per sale uh, for new people. And then return on ad spend if it's um, e-commerce or something like that. But I, I think a lot of Facebook people jump over and they start with quality score and click-through rate and impression share. It's like that that is a diagnostic one. Impression share just is there more volume? Are you getting a lot of volume? And then um, quality score is it a high converting thing first or if it's not what's the problem is there a problem with the click-through rate because who cares about the click-through rate if it's irrelevant to conversions if, if it's your top selling one how can you get a higher click-through rate get more volume to that it's a really low click-through rate but an extremely high conversion rate it's like well maybe you're filtering out you know don't click on it unless you're actually going to buy it so if you have a two percent click-through rate but it's the top converter in the entire account the ROAS is incredible. Don't rewrite the ad. Maybe it is filtering people that aren't ready to buy. So you, when you look at those numbers, secondary rather than primary, it's not necessarily get the click-through rate up, get that quality score up, and, and life is good. It's like you forgot the most important part of advertising. All of these other things, yeah, it's it's a diagnostic. It's digging into all, the, all this other junk if if there's a problem with the main thing, which, which is profit. And there are, there's columns for that. Stay there, and then second, and third, and fourth are, are all these other things to, to get, dig into. Yeah, Google knows this, for sure, that paid social people are coming over to Google and learning PPC instead of the other way around, which yeah, I feel like back in the day was more common, where people would learn Google Ads first and then learn meta yeah and i think it, i think that's actually the better way to do it personally because you learn a lot of the technical more technical aspects of google ads and then you know you learn a little bit about the creative side which is obviously much more important on meta um i think you learn a lot more fundamentals and then you can you know translate them over to meta i think coming the other way is often quite tough as you said people from paid social backgrounds will often come and apply the same principles uh one that comes to mind is actually the budget setting um where google will always look at the budget on a monthly basis yeah and i feel like i say this every single day um because i always get questions from clients or agencies where it's oh you know we're overpacing we're underpacing but i always just literally hover over the eye and say look it says you can spend up to two times your daily budget 
and over a 30 or 30.4 or whatever multiplier you want to use average days in a month it will spend that per month right you you know you've got um start end dates and, and kind of budget limits and stuff like that as well but it will average out over the month um, i think it does a really good job of that but on meta side, it's more a daily budget, right? Or a weekly budget they optimize the source. Uh, it, it, it's the daily and it's weird. Meta will hit the exact number to the penny. It's, it's daily, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's a very different mentality, right? Like trying to optimize towards a daily budget rather than a monthly budget. That's totally different mentality. Yeah, and I, I think coming from paid social or uh, even SEO, it's just kind of the checklist and, and they'll go and take the, the Google certification, which just gets worse every year. It's kind of memorize whatever they tell you and all the new features and it says, you know, auto apply recommendation is the best thing ever. And there's 40 questions on the test about auto apply recommendations and optimization score, which if you don't know, if you're outside, it's like, okay, get my optimization score up. And, you know, it, it literally goes up if you raise the budget. And I think that's the, the way to instantly know it's garbage. Incle increase optimization score by 20% by increasing your budget. It's like, okay, it's a fake metric. Th that's the end of that. Uh, but they, they go through that checklist and they just lose the, it's like, you know, there are columns for conversions, cost per conversion, conversion rate return on ad spend is an actual column it's like drop those in those are your three to four that's where you live that's the most important thing and google doesn't really say that and people get stuck on click-through rate and all this other junk it's like you need to live in those other columns if you're coming from from paid social or seo uh or brand new business owner want to run it yourself it's like go back to ads 50 years ago they need to make profit Forget all the other technical stuff. How much money did you put in? How much money did you get out? And and that will be the same forever moving forward. Yeah, I, I wonder if Google is moving towards making the products more accessible to paid social people and, you know, bringing in those features like lookalike audiences, video ads, carousel ads with demand gen, yeah. performance max, you know, I wonder if they're bringing in those with the focus groups behind closed doors. I wonder if that's what's happening where they're realizing, I'm sure they know this, that a lot of paid social people are coming over to Google. And I actually quite controversial have said in the past that paid social guys run YouTube a lot better than PPC guys will. They do. Um, I, I saw this at a lot of brands I worked at actually. And when i was tasked with the youtube i would pretty much hand it off to the paid social guys yeah it it runs similar kind of uh, it, it's more about the creative and it's about five or ten seconds of the video which that's more their world they're trying you're trying to again that's i we do some of that but was it stop the scroll or scroll stopping ad or so that's that's kind of their thing it's like you're scrolling through uh, Facebook or TikTok, which is just Facebook on, on, I probably shouldn't say that on YouTube. Uh, it's the crazier version of Facebook. <laughs> Almost said something, but you know, YouTube can read, read, uh, transcripts. Uh, it's the insane version of YouTube. So either way, it, or, uh, uh, Facebook. So your, your video needs to stop them and grab their attention. Um, so I think they jump right into YouTube. You don't really have keywords. You're kind of, uh, interest behaviors. And, and first five seconds needs to grab them and get them to buy. It's like, that's a Facebook world. A PPC, lo looking at keywords, I think we're more data-driven, more analytical, more nerdy, and they're more um, psychological and colors and backgrounds and sounds and, and what was said in the script. It's like, that's social. That's not technical PPC that we're used to. So I, th I think you're right. They do better with YouTube. Yeah, I get the question pretty much daily from a lot of other PPC freelancers, like, how can I improve? And one of the main things I always say to them is improve in your creative chops, you know, like look at brands, study brands, study marketing as a whole, other channels, you know, break down creative and see what works from it. So it's very easy to yeah get stuck in your account, stuck in your ways, you know, get into all the technical nitty and gritty, which, as I said, I feel like is becoming quite a level playing field it's a lot easier, I think, to really have that competitive advantage on the creative side. 
you know, if you know something about the product or the pain points that the customer is facing that your competition doesn't, you can really write that headline that will just convert, you know, so much better. Um, and then on the YouTube side, obviously it's, I think in general, Google Ads is moving towards that side a lot more with display, demand gen, YouTube. There's a lot of brands coming to me asking me for YouTube now. Yeah. And Performance Max, you know, incorporating all those things. There's a massive, massive switch to, yeah, you have to know how to make strong creative, not just write strong ad copy, right? Yeah, and uh, we we do a lot of display, uh, and and we actually have that in our course, uh, and and people forget about that. Display can be very powerful, and the targeting is pretty much the same as YouTube. If you can do YouTube, and we've done that too, we'll drop something in YouTube, a custom audience. You know, here's 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 something for free. You don't have to buy the course. Uh, we'll do a custom audience uh, with. Uh, a website so I, I can't say the actual client but let's just say it's 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 accountants uh, give me people that are uh, can't do the literal example but uh, a website where they would go maybe it's accountingnews.com all the accountants go to accountingnews.com all day every day so we know uh, it's, it's the custom audience where you drop in the URL you drop in one URL at a time and test this this is the way we learn to do it it's a custom audience with um, uh, accountantnews.com or whatever uh, and it's it's that and then the product again an example is uh, accounting software this is premium enterprise level accounting software is the product so you get people that are on accountingnews.com all day as a custom audience and then the YouTube ad is accounting software and that worked extremely well it just crushed search for accounting software and a couple hundred other variations of it. The actual bottom of the funnel, I need to buy accounting software because the CPC is so insanely high. It's you know 30 to $50. It's like, give me a custom audience, drop it on YouTube, and it actually worked much, much better. And then we took that exact same custom audience of people that are on accountingnews.com and then threw it on a custom audience for display. And it did the exact same thing just crushed the search result. And the client doesn't care, they want, they want the results. So um, a, a custom audience, which is kind of like paid social, just get me people that like this and this is their behavior and just follow them. And, and it, it worked on YouTube and it, it worked on display because those are pretty much the same targeting options. And and people forget about that. Like don't, don't sleep on custom audiences, in market, affinity, these behavioral ones are extremely powerful if you know how to use them in Google. And this is where you can also pull from SEO as well. Yeah. Um, Search Console and all, all the other organic tools where I work very closely with SEO guys at any brand I work with because they often, I find, have the best insights pretty much out of the whole company, actually. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe second to the PPC guys. I don't know. But... The SEO guys just have such a deep understanding of the pain points your customers are facing, the journey they go on, the whole funnel, the questions they're asking. You know, a quick one that I pop on LinkedIn quite a lot is to use alsoasked.com. That will show you yeah. the frequently asked questions um, around any keyword. You can also localize it as well to any country you like. I use it quite a lot for my US clients um, since I'm in the UK. I'll type in like the main keyword from their account, from their Google Ads account. And then also ask.com will show me all the frequently asked questions around that topic. And it's super useful, especially in early keyword research as well, as well as later on in the account, if you're taking over an established account as well, and you're wondering like, do these keywords make sense? It's often a question I ask myself, you know, if another agency has been running the account or someone's been running the account and hasn't really paid too much attention to it. Has those keywords changed over time? You know, has the buyer changed over time? You know, um, some accounts, you can run the same keywords for years and years and get great results. Some accounts, the keywords change year to year. You know, there's, there's all the seasonality and people like to joke about seasonality and it being a bit of an excuse, but it's definitely true within keywords, right? So the questions people ask around a topic and around a product will change, you know, whether it's January or summer. Yeah, yeah, the just finding finding the right audience i i think that's a theme 
that keeps moving forward because we got so used to our keywords and we'd get exact match or many years ago, the single keyword AdWords, the Skags, and you'd have all these little hacks with your manual bidding and you tweak it 20 cents or a dollar every other day. It, it, it's more going to this audience and interest. And I think the paid social people, if, if they learn to look at the right metrics, not quality score, that can pivot a lot more to them. They'll jump right into YouTube and it's like, oh, look, there's a custom audience. I can do remarketing. I can do this. I can do that. All these other options are in the market, which is kind of more how Facebook is. You drop that into YouTube and then the secret everybody forgets about, exact same thing with display. Drop in some responsive ads, use your custom audience, use your your end market or demographics. We've done it for all different real estate stuff. There's homeowners uh, that's a big one. If, if you're doing a uh, remodeling or security system, it's like put this in front of homeowners. It has to be a big ticket thing, but just show show a banner ad or show a YouTube ad to homeowners about some kind of home service. It's like that's more of a Facebook thing. You've pinpointed the type of person. It's really cheap clicks. It's a longer funnel, but typically when it when it's twenty to a hundred thousand dollar thing like a remodeling service that can actually work better than it's like, I want home remodeling in this city, which is the old way to do it with your exact match. Now it's like, well, that's $50 a click. You can get 20 cents and just follow homeowners until they they get a kitchen remodel for a hundred grand or something like that. And it's like that, whatever's profitable. And I, I think moving forward, PPCs have to switch to that. Don't just get caught up on your exact match keywords that aren't even exact match anymore. They're turning into a theme also. Yeah, that's pretty annoying with exact match, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I find that recently a lot in accounts. But flipping that on its head, you can really bit bring business insights out of Google and also to other channels as well. So I had a consultation recently, I just thought of, that had a guy who ran a skincare brand. It was vegan, very sustainable skincare, foot scrubs, body washes, those kind of things. And he came to me saying that his Google ads was rubbish. It, he was losing thousands of pounds every month. Um, he wasn't selling much. He's also running meta ads as well. And we had a quick look through the account and we actually spent 45 minutes of the 60 minute consultation talking about his business. We spent very little time in the account, actually. Yeah. It was more like, show me your landing pages, show me your website, and uh, let me understand around your products, right? And he was selling five pound foot scrubs with a five pound delivery. And I just played that back to him of, look, this is the buyer's journey. Let's go through it, right? You click on an ad, you land on your landing page, really nice products, really great brand. But they're buying a five pound foot scrub and then they're paying five pound delivery. Yeah. That's just flat out annoying, dude. Like, that's just annoying. So why are you not bundling that in? And also, if we look at your competitors, for example, Lush is big in the UK here. I don't know if it is. They're in the big US. here, yeah. Yeah. So if you go into a Lush store, how much do you expect to spend? You don't expect to spend five pounds. If you're buying something from Lush, you're not going to spend five pounds. You're going to expect to spend thirty to fifty plus, right? Yeah. Minimum, like one or two products. Just think of, oh, if I wanted to buy one or two things, you're going in for something specific. It's going to be at least. 20 30 40 dollars right so i said why don't you do a bundle and he was like oh none of our products are that expensive i said okay well if you don't want to raise the product raise the price of the product then you can at least do a bundle of all your best-selling products and that was more of a business decision that i've seen work a lot um on other brands i've worked with and google ads and it brought him all the way up to i actually got a text from him a couple of days ago brought him all the way up to one rabas um, from way negative rounds, yeah. brought him all the way up to one on Google, um, which was great, but then actually flew on social. So he did the same thing where he did the bundles on Meta, and that actually netted him massive, massive return to the point now where he said that we're actually um, production constrained. We actually can't make enough because we're selling so much on Meta oh, wow. from the bundles. So um, that's always something to think about is the average order value. And that works differently for different platforms. But with the business insights, I think people overlook that Google ads can give you insights that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And, and that's interesting talking about the business that, that also connects to what we talked about kind of at the very beginning. You said re reading a lot of marketing books and I think generic business and generic marketing books and some of them could even be 30 years old, just just business marketing, creating an avatar, who's your ideal customer 
you know, like Russell Brunson and a lot of other them, they're not, they don't dive in that deep. It's all really high level, but there's still a lot of value. And I, I think PPC or even paid social, they get so technical, they forget about that stuff. And they don't step back and just look at a business. He said 45 minutes of the call was just learning about the business. It's like, well, you better do that before you start start running ads. And that one in particular, a lot of times it's so competitive, you have to step back and, and set a realistic goal that this is probably going to be break even, but it's it's a product you're going to run out of. And you need to look at lifetime value. It's a... Uh, um, or not a consumable, but uh, you 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 use it up. Uh, so if if it's soap, it's if it's their foot scrub, something like that. Uh, I mean, about monthly, every six weeks, and then if if it's their favorite soap, hypothetically, it'd be for years. It's what works for their skin. It, it it's not itchy. Maybe they have allergies. It's vegan. Something to where they will seek out something very specific. So you're no longer competing. Uh, with soap at the grocery store, it, it, it's not side by side. So they found that they're vegan, unique thing, hypoallergenic, whatever it is. So maybe you break, break even or lose a tiny bit of money, uh, which is just what you see inside of Google or Facebook. But it's like, well, how long is that person going to stay? It's like probably years. And then that's when you need to dig in your, your lifetime value. And you know that by knowing the business, not just PPC. Yeah, it's a good example on locations as well, actually, because I work with a lot of worldwide brands that might advertise in the UK, Europe, Germany, Poland, and then the US, and then some that advertise in Japan, you know, Asia as well. And it's quite funny when you take over an account and you start you start going through on a call with the client, the account, okay, we've got an account running, a, a campaign running in UK, US, Asia, Poland, and I'm like, this campaign isn't doing very well. Do you actually want to sell in that country? A lot of the time, I'm like, ah, yeah, probably not, actually. We're not really that bothered. I'm like, okay, like, why has no one asked you this up until this point, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I find that all the time where I'm like, where's your focus? Where's your, because a lot of the time, they don't have the right customer service. They don't have the right, uh, you know, opening hours to support different uh, territories around the world, you know? So I see that a lot with US um, companies that quite, can't struggle to kind of service UK clients or people or shipping, you know, to the UK, they run into all kinds of problems. So a lot of the time it's actually better to say, let's just stop, you know, let's nail one country. Let's really go deep on, for example, US is a lot of, a lot of what I bring it back to with a lot of clients that I work with. Um, you know, let's forget about the UK. Let's forget about Europe because we're not doing so well in the US right now. Let's nail that first and then we can expand. Right. And I really like with the US actually how you can, or at least for me, I treat every state like it's its own country. It is. So, <laughs> right? So you need that localization. And that's a big thing I'm, I'm, I'm big on as well is localization per state, per country around the world, right? Like talk like they talk, you know, use the local lingo. There's normally someone in that company that might be from that place that you can use and just talk to them and just say, would you like this? Would you buy this? Would you, you know, if you read this headline, would it resonate with you? Would it seem like a local company? Or does it sound like, you know, for example, I get put off sometimes if I'm searching for something and it sounds like a US company and I'm like, oh, well, I don't want to wait. You know, I'd rather buy from a UK company that I know is probably going to be based here. Logistics is going to be here. You know, it's going to ship much faster to me. So it's the same if you flip on its head, like if you're advertising in Japan, you don't really want to come across like a UK company, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, I could speak to the U.S. living here, uh, you really do have to treat the different states or at least the different regions differently because if you want to be edgy or make a joke or something like that, one part of the country might find it funny and it'll resonate well. Another part may be highly offended and, and then you're, you have a, a PR issue. And, and same thing with other countries, different belief systems, uh, what's important to them. And as an advertiser, that's not a PPC thing. That that's a marketing thing. That's a PR thing. That's a business thing. To where, um, if you really want to push something or a particular angle, you have to know where you're going there and and look at different what's sensitive to that area, what appeals to them. Uh, you know, being um, there's a lot of jokes, but I, I won't say them. Like Texas, uh, it's it's kind of its own country in the U.S. It's it does its own thing, but. Um, I won't get into the politics of it. There's a, plenty of other YouTube channels for politics. You can go watch those. 
Um, but the one thing is in, in this particular state, they're, they're very proud to be Texan. So if it's made there, if it's built there, if it's a Texas owned company, uh, it's, it's called the Lone Star State and pretty much every other state, not many other states actually gave themselves a name. Nobody cares. Uh, but you could put Lone Star all over Texas. It's the Lone Star State. Everybody knows that. And there's Texas flags all over Texas and uh, Texas pride made in Texas. Uh, that, that matters to Texas. Whereas another state, it doesn't really matter that it's made there. It, it, it's a lot of people moving from somewhere else, depending on the area, where, whereas Texas is more born and raised here, generations, tradition, pride, that sort of thing is very deep here, and that would resonate. Whereas another state, nobody really cares if it's made in the same state that, it, that it's sold. Uh, so that's a soft, non-political example. But you, you have to look at that, especially if you're going into different countries. A U.S. country going into Europe. It's like, do you, do you even know who you're advertising to and what's sensitive there and what's important, what's going to resonate there? Yeah, you can strip it back to trends for sure um, as well, like less risky, not so much, you know, questions or jokes or anything like that. Just strip it back to trends as well. You know, different keywords will do differently. You know, I've had examples where it's like, you know, for example, Texas and, you know, California, um, it might be completely different like a topic people will talk about it completely differently so it might be vegan plant-based um you know non-gmo all those kind of things in one state you know vegan might be great and then in one state that's a bit of a turnoff maybe you know and they're not that interested in that for example yeah um yeah so i think when you're translating a lot of clients will this also happens a lot with subscription products i find they'll just translate the word subscribe and subscribe has many different meanings in different countries, oh, yeah. uh, languages, you know, uh, some, so for example, in Germany, I think it's typically more, um, recharge is what they kind of is more the translation that they use more. The word they use is recharge instead of subscription. And then you can talk about, you know, um, purchase access, all these different things that mean different things in different languages. An interesting uh, example I thought of when you were speaking there was actually Colombia, where you have you can advertise in Spanish, you can also advertise in English, um, but you can also advertise well mostly in like American English as well. So there's all those different like nuances as well between the different words and different spellings and phrases, which I think is super cool and something to you know test and play around with that most people don't even think about. Yeah, and and that's something if you're even going to translate to other language languages you, you have to look at uh i mean even w with slang if it's the us uh uk australia uh or other english spe speaking countries all over it's going to be a little bit different and if 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 you do uh you know keen or learnt or uh z and we say z for the letter um or h like if if it's if it's one of those subtle things and you put the wrong translation or the wrong accent or, or the wrong slang in the wrong country, it's going to stand out immediately. You know, oh, that's American English or that's British English or that that's that's an Australian thing. We don't really say that here. So if, if you you're writing it the same ad copy, you, you need to be aware of the, the local dialect and, and what resonates with them and, and different things like that. Or it's going to stand out uh, in a in a negative way. Right. I see this a lot with car companies. I've done some advertising the last year or two for a few car companies, and I see this a lot. Um, yeah, when they're advertising across different countries, you know, every single word is different. Yeah. It's a good example of an industry because every single part of a car is called a completely different word. Yeah. <laughs> for example, in the UK compared to America. So, um, yeah, it's, it does stick out like a sore thumb. You're totally right. Yeah, and, and you have to look at translations. There, there was a, a famous one. Uh, I, th I think it was the the Chevy uh, Nova, which Nova is, that's more, in, in English, that's more of a, I, I don't know, star thing. It's star, kind of something like that. Nova in Spanish is no-go, is pretty much what it translates to. So you had a, a Chevy no-go as a car. So it just flopped in Mexico like you can't call a car a no-go like that it didn't translate correctly and that it's just an old 
marketing thing, it's like you, you have to look at where it's advertising and different translations and what it means in that particular area. Yeah, to get really technical, you see that a lot with like regulatory stuff as well. Yeah. So, you know, with cars, you have the like EPA, WLTP, rating for electric cars, for example. And then you have that a lot in a lot of food and drink clients that I work for. You have a lot of different kind of testing and, um, you know, something that holds weight in one country in terms of a test or a non-GMO or something like that. In another country, it might be much stricter or, you know, that kind of phrase or certification might not mean anything, right? Yeah. So the best the best um, in-house roles I've ever had and the best brands I've seen absolutely, you know, crush it have had dedicated teams and dedicated people around, you know, an international team or people that are country champions that their whole job is literally just working on, you know, one territory or one uh, continent and localizing all the marketing stuff for that continent. Yeah, definitely. So that's that's something to definitely keep in mind. I wanted to circle back. Uh, I mean, what any other kind of predict, predictions going into 2024 you think PPC people should keep an eye on and, and how to adjust to it? Yeah, so I think we've covered most of them um, that I had down here. So I think we'll definitely see more Pro Max AI smart learning hilarious names in Google for sure. Um, I think keep being a product person. I think keep learning about the businesses you're advertising for. That's the advice I would give. Um, And going into 2024, that's going to be as important as ever, you know, when the controls taken away and more automation comes in and we have more of this generative AI, I think it's going to be really interesting when that comes into full force in the interface. Um, I think also Google ads editor, will still be something I'll be using every day. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a love of mine that not many people share. And I think a lot of people, it's a shame, a lot of people coming into the industry and learning Google Ads now and coming from the paid social side, they don't get to experience Google Ads Editor and they have to copy and paste in the interface and wait all this time and waste all this time. And yeah, I would say if you haven't tried it yet, download Google Ads Editor, it's as good as it has ever been it's actually been updated with some performance stuff in there now as well yeah so you can actually see summaries and optimizations and stuff like that um i would say also check your change history that's also as important as ever in 2024 they've just updated change history where you can actually see performance by time there's like a little chart so you can see if someone else made a change for example which often happens when you have multiple people working on an account, you can see if that really dropped or increased the performance over time. So that's super helpful, not have to you know rummage through all the notes and all the change history. So I'd say keep an eye on the change history going into 2024. Um, and think creative as well, like we touched on. Yeah. Creative will become even more important. So I would say, you know, everything you get for Christmas, study it, look at the packaging, Look at the pros and cons, you know, research it. I mean, that's how I started, you know, looking at brands to work for or, you know, clients I would like to have. It's just wrote a list. I looked on the apps on my phone. What apps do I have? What companies do I like? What companies do I spend money on, you know? Wrote a list down, my favorite apps, my favorite brands, and then just pick them apart. And then from that, you'll become a much better PPC expert. Yeah, definitely. I I, th- I think we need to just open up and not be so stubborn. I mean, I, I've done it myself. As you know, I'm, I'm not using Performance Max. It's trash, and then now it's in three fourths of the accounts. Uh, you ha- we had to learn it. I mean, it, it was a whole new thing. And then demand gen haven't really uh, dipped into that much, but we will. And then Advantage Plus audiences over on Meta. You know, you don't really get targeting. It just finds people magically, uh, and some of them have worked. You just you can't just put your foot down and say, I'm not trying that. It's not good. Uh, which before, yeah, you, you did manual bidding and, and, you know, exact match and all this other stuff. Now it's like, it doesn't work. You'll see that the volume will drop. It won't favor it. You have to learn these new things. And I, I think one thing that that's changed massively is how quickly all the changes come out and the need for constant training and education. 
you, you need to follow experts on LinkedIn. I mean, you're one of them, you know, you know, Miles is on there, a lot of great names. I don't have time to name everybody. I'll, I'll link some, uh, or, or, you know, the list that say people follow. And that's, that's a good free way to do it. At the very least, get some free training, follow people, follow good YouTube channels, follow people on LinkedIn, you know, blogs, get uh, uh, newsletters are huge. Uh, experts putting some really good stuff into that. That's all the free stuff. Uh, and then of course, you know, we're biased, but I'd say whoever it is, you, you need to buy some training if you can afford it. Cause you, you jump in to those masterminds, those weekend workshops, those group trainings, uh, the, some of them are free discord and Slack groups. Some of them are paid monthly service, the deep dives, the masterminds, the courses, books, webinars, uh, conferences in person or virtual. You, if, if you have the money or especially a company, you need to pay for some training, you know, or the one-on-one -on -one, like, like you do, just grab an expert and have them train your team. That's critical now more than ever. Whereas before you could just kind of look online, but it's like when, when you drop in performance max or they, they, they get rid of extended text ads or, or they roll something, um, you know, a certain broad match modifier, the different keywords, when things completely disappear and they're no longer available, that's when you need training more than ever. Free, paid, whatever, just it, PPCs needs to constantly be learning new things. And I, I think that's something that's changed and moving forward. If you're not constantly learning, you're, you're going to become obsolete and maybe find a new career if it's moving too fast for you. Yeah, 100%. I would recommend ppcsurvey.com. Yeah. Uh, I was just named most influential uh, top 100 globally PPC people. Yeah, congratulations and on that. That's awesome. Appreciate that. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a nice surprise. I haven't had any awards or anything like that so far. I think I need to probably seek out a few more maybe. Yeah, there's um, some good lists to get on. Fun. Yeah, in industry lists that are solid. Yeah. Yeah, I also got featured on a uh, Spanish one today. And apparently they spoke about me on their Spanish podcast. I'm trying to find a timestamp to work out <laughs> where oh, they yeah. mentioned me and why. But uh, yeah, I got featured on another list today, which was cool. Uh, but yeah, I'd recommend heading over to ppcsurvey.com and looking at the list as well, because even for me, there's a lot of new people on there yeah. that I didn't follow before. And yeah, there's a hundred people on there. And they have their links too. Followed. I love that they did right, that. Like, their podcast, their YouTube, the book, their training, their LinkedIn, wherever they are, like here's where you follow them i i, I think that was exactly. great that they did that yeah it was super cool because i only follow maybe 20 30 of those people already yeah. and i'm finding new content to consume i've literally been doing it this week and yeah i'd recommend going over there there's also a lot of different perspectives from different countries and you know um different experiences as well so that's really important to add to the mix when you're doing your paid training and courses and calls and stuff like that always great to get different perspectives as well to think about yeah and a lot of that you could get for free i don't want to push buying everything i know people are on different budgets if, if you follow a ton of experts on linkedin you, you can get a lot of updates and, and stay up to date pretty well uh for free as as well but the point is to 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 do it you can't just be an island in ppc and occasionally read a blog you're, you're gonna get left behind i would say dm people as well yeah. you know the experts on ppc are probably not as scary as you might think they are, even if they have 30, 40,000 followers, you know, I, I speak to a lot of them daily. And I remember when I had less than three, 2000 followers on LinkedIn, I would DM people and they would just chat to me, yeah. you know, for free, you know, it's great. If you have a quick question, obviously, you know, book that power hour, you know, book that time. If you're looking to kind of have a long discussion, yeah. but if you're looking for a quick question or an opinion on something, you know, it doesn't hurt. The worst that happens is they don't, don't reply so yeah they, you know stick yourself out there message people it's always good yeah they're there I've, I've found most of them are just regular people uh they'll reach back out they'll help you like you said, eventually you have to pay them I mean, i'm just going to talk to you for hours and hours and hours but if you just reach out a question or comment right there because that boosts the algorithm and shows it more <laughs> ask a question in a comment a lot of them will answer it themselves uh, it's actually their account, but yeah, just, just stay active. It's changing so fast. I mean, you, you have to, to be in an effective PPC now, whether you're, you know, uh, social SEO, uh, Google, whatever it is, you just, it, it's, it's changing fast. You got to keep up. 
Right. So, all right. I, th- I think we pretty much covered it. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of changes, a lot of great stuff. Thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate your insight and your constant post on LinkedIn and, and congratulations on being top 100. Uh, that, that's awesome. No, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me on. I'd appreciate anyone that votes for me on the PPC survey as well. I'd love to make the top 25. That would be uh, super cool. But if not being voted top 100 is a, uh, pleasure in itself yeah and i'll, I'll link below uh, how can people reach out to you what's the best way my linkedin so search me tomash abbevichurek on linkedin dm me i still reply to all my dms myself um and uh yeah i love to hear from people i love to hear ideas of content as well i'm very community led with my personal brand so everything i put out is really even my power hours is around what people want so please dm me if you would like more content or anything we spoke about in this podcast any particular topic if you would like me to write more about that if you'd like us to create more content on that that's always super helpful and then we'll create the content you want all right sounds good yeah i'll drop a link in here you can people can reach out to and uh thanks again for being on the show i really appreciate your time appreciate it thanks chris thanks bye All right, everyone, thanks so much for watching our PPC ads training video. Uh, If you want more videos, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Uh, Like this video if you found it useful. And any questions, post them in the comments down below. Uh, We also have additional training in the description. So thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.